If you sang that from the heart, I can promise you that you you will be changed. The Lord will change you. He will speak to you. And He will work in you. Well, let's turn together to our New Testament reading. If you need a Bible, there's uh, some left on the cart down, uh, down the center aisle there. If we run out of them, uh, there's a bookshelf. The top shelf of that bookshelf in the corner has some other copies on it. And you're welcome to use those as well. If you're using the church Bible, uh, you can turn to page 1749, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, uh, where we will uh, find our New Testament reading this morning, page 1749 in the church Bible. Uh, we looked at um, a few weeks back, it's, uh, verses 8 through 10. This morning we're going to read uh, 1 through 7. 1 through 7. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, this is the word of the living God. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on those who practice, on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right, let's turn together to Exodus chapter 20, um, verse 12, where we will begin our look this morning at the fifth commandment. And um, I know some of us here uh, are not... Uh, we're, well, we're all children here in a sense that we all have parents, right? So we'll find, each one of us here will find uh, this meditation on this command applicable to our lives. And um, you don't need to have children in the home to, uh, to take an interest in what is being taught here. Um, of course, the children themselves will uh, want to pay uh, special attention to the things that we um, learn from God's word and that flow from this uh, one verse of scripture, which is the fifth commandment. And I'm going to read that to you now, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and reminding you this is God's holy word. And we are told there, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And this is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we uh, confess with delight that uh, your word endures forever and uh, that this is a, a passage of scripture that you want uh, and you will write upon the hearts of your people uh, by your Holy Spirit to cause us to walk in your ways. And, and Lord, may that is our prayer this morning is that you would cause us to walk in your ways by working in our heart by your word and spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start looking at the fifth commandment. This is going to be our first look at it this morning, and I'm, I hope you don't mind us going slow as we have been through the, these. I think it's, it's very important to take time to meditate on these, and, and there's a, a lot here. I'm, I'm actually, I did four sermons on the fourth commandment, and I, and I skipped a bunch of stuff, and it kind of frustrates me. Um, but you can't get to everything. But as we look at the fifth commandment, this first look, I want to take a look at the big picture today. And actually, what I want to do is I want to put the fifth commandment on a pedestal. I want to lift it up. I want to make the case that apart from the first four commandments, this commandment is the one that most needs to capture our attention. In fact, 
it's, it's hard for me to see how obedience to the first four and to the last five commandments is even possible without the fifth commandment first being taught and promoted. It, this commandment should be treasured as one of the most brilliant jewels in the crown of wisdom that Solomon talks about in the Proverbs. It, I've been praying that all who hear today's message, uh, whether you hear it today or in the future online, that you will have the eyes of your heart enlightened to see the great importance of the fifth commandment. And all, all I want to do this morning is give you four reasons why the fifth commandment is particularly important to the people of God and to the mission of, that God has for us in this world. And, and so let me say at the outset, uh, these points, these observations are not original to me. Uh, I have gleaned them from some of my fathers in the faith. And I want to point that out to you because, children, it, it, it connects to the fifth commandment itself. I've, I'm gaining wisdom that surpasses my own understanding. I'm gaining wisdom from my fathers in the faith so that I can surpass the wisdom that I have now. And that is one way to observe the fifth commandment, is to be teachable and to learn from your fathers in the faith. And the fifth commandment is of colossal importance because, first of all, God gives particular emphasis in his word to this commandment. This is a commandment. That it, it, I, 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 can't do, I, haven't, can't, I haven't counted them all up, but this commandment gets unusually uh, frequent mention in the word of God. Uh, the late pastor Ed Donnelly uh, wisely points out that, that when God s has something to tell us, he should only have to tell us once, Right? He should only have to say it once, and then we do it, right? Now, children, if uh, your parents uh, have to tell you to do something more than once, uh, if they have to repeat themselves to you, you are being a rebel. Okay? Let's just be frank. <laughs> You're being a rebel. And parents, we, we should not have to count to three. The, do that slow count to three or, or to four or to five before we hold our children accountable for delaying their obedience. That's not, that does not help them at all. That's not helpful. One command should be enough if our hearts are submissive to God. Delayed obedience, reluctant obedience, uncheerful obedience, those are all forms of rebellion that we ought to confess and repent of right away. But we see the vastness of the Lord's patience with us in the fact that he doesn't just command us once, that he reminds us again and again and again in his word about the importance of the fifth commandment. He, he shows us actually quite vividly that he takes disobedience uh, to parents, dis, the dishonoring of parents, he takes this very seriously. With your Bibles open, turn to the next page, maybe it's even on uh, the page in front of you, Exodus chapter 21, verse 15. Look at it. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Look at verse 17, 21, 17. And he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Now maybe you're familiar with the Lord's commands uh, in Deuteronomy 21, about how, how do we deal with a, with a disobedient, uh, rebellious child? And the Lord says there, uh, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. The Lord takes the fifth commandment very seriously, doesn't he? 
And do you, if parents, uh, well, let's look at another verse here. This is one, a favorite of, of some of us, I'm sure. Uh, Proverbs 30, 17. The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pluck it out and the young eagles will eat it. In other words, if parents and if the elders of the city will not take care of the disobedient children in the kingdom of God, that God will send the ravens to take care of it. Think about that. The Lord means business when it comes to the fifth commandment. And most of us here, sorry, most of us here know about the warnings that God gives us in his word describing just how bad the conditions will be at, in the last days, right? When the, before, at the time of Jesus' second coming, those days are described in Scripture as being very, very dark. And children, do you know how, how uh, those days are described with respect to children? Well, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 4, we read this, but know this, that in the last days, Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, God could not be clearer. He emphasizes the importance of the fifth commandment in his word. There is no place in the kingdom of God for those who do not honor their father and their mother. The disobedient will be cast out of that kingdom. But the word of God doesn't only show us the great importance of the fifth commandment by emphasizing what will happen to those who break it. No, There is an entire book of the Bible that presents us with the blessings that come upon those who embrace the fifth commandment. And I told you this earlier, it's the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, the entire book is a a father pleading with his son, with his daughter, uh, to receive the blessings that God has for those who learn to receive wisdom from their parents and they learn the fear of the Lord. Now, I'll just skim some of these. Proverbs chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Chapter 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I read you uh, Proverbs 3, 1 and 2 earlier. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Chapter 4, hear, my children, the instruction of a father and give Attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. And I could go on. Every chapter in in Proverbs has a command similar to that. And it is God pleading with us, pleading with us as his children, pleading to us as children, and enticing us with blessings and rewards that he promises to those who learn to fear him and to honor father and mother. In Paul's letters, like Ephesians and Colossians, he he directly addresses little children. And you know what that's one of the things that teaches us is that Paul expected the little children to be present in the worship when the people of God were gathered together so that they could hear the sermon that Paul had for them, read to them. Paul wakes them up maybe when they were sleeping. We saw that last week, poor Eutychus falling out of the, the third story window. Paul in Ephesians 6 says directly to children. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. 
And all of this goes to show that God emphasizes in his word the great importance of the fifth commandment. Now secondly, the fifth commandment is of great importance. We know this because it is, it's the bridge commandment. It's the bridge commandment. We, we have seen so far as in our look at the first four commandments that they teach us, the first four teach us how to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now the last six teach us how to love our neighbor as ourself, right? And the fifth commandment is the bridge between uh, the, the, the first four and the last six. They, it's the connection that binds together the love of God and the love of neighbor. I once heard a pastor ask his congregation, if the Lord gave you the last six commandments and they were all mixed up in no particular order, and he said, now you, you put them in order, what order would you put them in? Or what commandment would you put first out of the last six? And I bet most of us here wouldn't pick honor thy father and mother. We would think, well, murdering's, not murdering people is more important. Not, not committing adultery, not stealing, not lying. Maybe, maybe we would put those ahead of honoring parents. Not that honoring our parents isn't important, but these other ones, they, they really seem to, to stand out as, as particularly heinous. But this is the one that the Lord put first. And for good reason. Children, what is our, as human beings, what is our biggest and most basic problem? What is our biggest and most basic problem? It's sin, isn't it? It's sin. And what was the first sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve? What was their first sin? They rejected the authority of God their Father. That's the first sin. And from that first sin, the rejection of the authority of God is our Father. From that sin flows every other sin, including murder and adultery and stealing, and lying, and thieving, and, and covetousness. So how does a child that, who is born a sinner learn that God has the right to tell him what to do? Because that's what we need if we're going to be saved, right? From our sins. How does a child that, who is a sinner Learn that God has the right to tell him what to do. Well, in the wisdom of God, the, te- the Lord teaches a sinful child. He starts that process by first making him a child. The Lord, he teaches us what, that we are under his authority by first placing us under the authority of an earthly mother and father. And we, we have to... We, we have to answer to that them. We, we have to obey them if we want to live, if we want to survive, right? God established the family so that children would learn to submit to authority. And so it is, children, from the day of your birth, the only way that you have stayed alive to this moment in time is by receiving what your mother and father provided you, right? Right? You were born completely helpless. You literally lived on the wisdom and instruction that your parents gave you. You were so ignorant and foolish. I was too. I'm not just speaking of you. I I too. We were so ignorant and foolish when we were born and when we were little that we would have run out into a busy street to play. We, We would touch the hot stove to see what it felt like. You couldn't feed yourself, you couldn't clothe yourself, you couldn't clean yourself up. From the day of your birth, you have had to look to your parents for everything. Don't miss the spiritual lesson that God has for you in that. There's a spiritual lesson in that truth, in that reality. By His design, you started your life in a state of helplessness. You started your life in, in a condition of dependency upon your, mo- your mother and your father, 
so that you could stay alive. What's the spiritual lesson in that? What is God saying to you in that? God is teaching you that you can't have eternal life without submitting yourself to the one who made you, to the one that you are truly dependent upon. You cannot live in the ultimate sense of what that word means. You cannot enjoy true life, eternal life, without submitting to the authority of God. And he put you under parents to teach you that reality. And we have to learn it if we're going to be saved. Now sadly, it, it won't always be our biological mother or our biological father whom the Lord uses to teach us these spiritual lessons. But that is his declared will for us as parents, moms and dads. We are to use the physical dependence our children have on us to teach them their spiritual dependence upon God their Father. We are to teach them how to live, not to answer to our authority, but to answer to his authority. And we teach them that by showing them the blessings of living under our authority and teaching them the pain of trying to remove themselves from our authority. And even unbelievers recognize the significance of the fact that when, when God made children, when he creates children, he makes them like clay, right? These little babies, and I think of baby Trinity being born. I was looking at her yesterday as I went to visit, and I, I'm thinking, she's just like a lump of clay. She's going to be, she's so impressionable. She's going to be molded and shaped by those who teach her and influence her. And God made the little children like that. And even unbelievers recognize the significance of that fact. It's the expressed motto of the Roman Catholic Order of Jesuits. Their express motto from the, their founder, Ignatius of Loyola, he said, give me a child for the first seven years and I will have that child for life. Shaping children while they are young. That was part of the communists' takeover in Russia. Vladimir Lenin, that was part of his strategy. It was part of Adolf Hitler's strategy. Hitler's youth, he, got the, he didn't go for the old people that were, uh, were hard and crusty. He went for the young people who were impressionable. And they started world-altering revolutions. The LGBTQ community is trying to do the same thing today with Drag Queen Story Hour. They know, right? They, they know. They, they, they're shaping impressionable children to make them their lifelong allies. And we're supposed to do that with our children to make them lifelong allies and friends of the God who made them. And one of the main tools the Lord has given his children for changing the world is giving us moldable children and giving us the fifth commandment. And if we lovingly, consistently teach our children to respect and to accept and to live under authority, and if we teach them that all authority is God's authority, we can raise a new generation that will be well-equipped to turn the world upside down in obedience to the Word of God. But as uh, Ed Donnelly points out, if our children are not taught this, if our children reject our authority as parents, it will be difficult for them to accept authority in any other sphere of life. And children, if you do not learn how to live under authority, you will live in a box. You might quite literally live in a prison cell. That's what's at stake. And even more than that. Children, if you do not honor your mother and your father and cheerfully live under their authority, you are living in rebellion against the God who made you. And your only hope is to confess that sin, to turn from that sin, and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And then to follow him as the one who obeyed his father. More on that in a little while. 
But unless you turn from the sin of rebelling against authority and come to Jesus Christ, the rest of your life will be, uh, will be about one thing, and it will be violating the law of God. That's what your life will be summarized as a lawbreaker. And parents, we, we mustn't overlook even the smallest act of rebellion in our children, let alone tolerate it, let alone turn a blind eye to it, right? Sometimes you can hear parents laugh as they confess that their child is spoiled, as if that was something cute, right? Of course, children, you, we, we, lo- we love to be spoiled, right? But what does it mean to be spoiled? Think about it. What does it mean to be spoiled? When something is spoiled, it is rotten. And what's rot? Rot is death. It's death. A, a child, a spoiled child, is one who is allowed to think that he should get what he wants. And so hear me, both parents and children, that kind of child is like a piece of fruit that is rotten. And unless that rot is cut out, that death will spread throughout all of their, all that they are. To avoid eternal death, a person must be taught to submit to the authority of God as their father. Do you see why, brothers and sisters, the fifth commandment is so important? It's important because the Lord emphasizes it in his word. It's important because it is the bridge commandment that holds the first four together to the last five. And now thirdly, it is important because our whole society is against it. I'll flesh this more out more next week, but but there is another commandment that shapes American culture today. It's a corrupted version of the fifth commandment, and I would put it like this. You shall dishonor your father and mother if you want a prosperous life with the cool kids. Your parents don't know what they're talking about, but we do. Isn't that, kids, isn't that what the world is telling you? Isn't that what it's communicating to you? Your parents are a bunch of dummies. They don't know what they're talking about. But we do. According to ancient Hebrew wisdom, the only way to go into the future is by looking to those who have gone before us. Uh, the, in fact, the Hebrew word for future The Hebrew word for future is derived from the Hebrew word that means to be behind. And and so in biblical thinking, the future is behind you. Does that sound kind of contrary? Uh, the, The Hebrew word for the past is derived from the Hebrew word that means in front of. So the past is in front of you. Does that sound backwards? I would submit to you not at all. Not according to biblical wisdom. In biblical wisdom, the only way, the right way, and the only safe way to go into the future is to look into the past. That is, to look to your elders. To look to your mothers and fathers who have the wisdom that you don't have. The only safe way to go into the future is to look to your forefathers, to your elders. And there used to be a time in which the Christian West used to believe that. It actually wasn't that long ago. New ideas, 150 years ago, new ideas in the Christian church were viewed as almost always bad ideas. New ideas were almost always bad. Why? Because the truth is ancient. The truth is ancient. Truth and wisdom belong 
to the elderly, not to the young. And the most revered and cherished people in society used to be our elders, the elderly people. But what about today? The the attitude today is the exact opposite, even in the church. Our forefathers seldom get a voice. They seldom get a vote as we're concocting all of these wild ideas, how we're going to uh, mold the church and Christianity into the thing that we want it to be. And modern culture itself is a cult uh, of youth, a cult obsessed with youth. And it, it disposes of everything that is older than five minutes. The word contemporary, think about the word contemporary. We think it means uh, present, right? But the word itself means, comes from, is a compound of, with the word temporary. Things that are contemporary are things that we're planning to ditch in just a few minutes for the next new thing. That's not wise. There's no honor for fathers and mothers in our culture. The goal today is, to, is actually to rebel against, uh, and to tear down, to replace the culture and the traditions and the wisdom of our forefathers, replacing them with the, the latest fads. Well, I, I would tell you, necessarily, necessarily, uh, the kind of culture that is created by people who, have, who think that way that cult, the culture they will create will be childish, it will be foolish, it will be shallow, it will be hollow, it will be hedonistic. It will, be, uh, it will prefer the temporary over the permanent and the eternal. It will, it will exalt what is cliche and what is disposable over what is timeless and what is worthy of being conserved. I think I just pretty accurately described American culture. We live in a society that is programmed to systemically rebel against the values and the norms of our forefathers. But I want you to see, young people, that, only, that cuts you off from the ageless wisdom of God that he has given to your elders, that they are to pass down to you. But if you're not interested in having anything passed down to you and you want to invent it for yourself, you will be by definition a fool. You will be a child. And so the way to stop the advance of the rot of secularism and hedonism in American Christian culture is for us to to come fully once again under the authority of the Word of God. And you know what that will mean? It will mean humbly listening to our mothers and fathers in the faith and moving into the future by looking to the past and reclaiming the very best of our Christian heritage and making it our own. Only then will we, as the church, truly be that life-preserving salt that Jesus would have us to be in this rotting society of ours. We need to recover the importance of the fifth commandment, first, because God emphasizes its importance in his word, secondly, because it is the commandment that bridges the first four to the last five, thirdly, because our whole society is against it, and lastly, I told you there were four, because God elevates the fifth commandment with a promise. The Apostle Paul we saw in Ephesians um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he says, that is the first commandment with a promise. And children, what is the promise that the Lord makes to those who honor Him by honoring their father and their mother? Well, Moses put it like this in Exodus uh, 20, 12. He says, Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, we need to notice here, you notice that there's a difference in, in how Paul, when he quotes the commandment, he actually he alters it. He makes a change to it, to the promise. He makes a change to the promise there in Ephesians 6. Paul says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You see the difference? And as we, we've seen with other Old Covenant laws, 
when Jesus comes as the true son of David, as the true king of Israel, he comes not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. He comes for the nations. And, and with the coming of Jesus into the world, the kingdom of God is expanded to include all of the nations of the earth, just as it was promised to Abraham, right? And the promise that the Lord made to Abraham and to his children, it also is expanded, right? You might remember in Genesis 15, the promise was, Abraham, look, look to the east and the west, to the north and to the south. All of the land that you see, this, this little strip of land, of, of the land of Palestine, yeah, I'm going to give it to you. It is going to be your inheritance forever. But when Paul talks about that promise that was made to Abraham in Romans chapter 4, um, he makes sure to describe it in such a way that we see that God has actually changed the promise. He's expanded the promise. Paul says there, uh, for the promise that he would be, he is Abraham, he would be the heir of the, he doesn't say the land. He says the cosmos. Do you know what the cosmos is, young people? The cosmos, that's the Greek word that means every created thing. That is the promise that God made to Abraham and to his children. The, the promise has been expanded beyond that little strip of land in the Middle East. The Old Covenant promise land, that Old Covenant promise land only foreshadowed the true promise, which was that Abraham and his seed would be the heirs of the cosmos, the entire created world, the new heavens and the new earth. That's what the Lord is giving to his people. So, I would submit to you, since there is a change of the promise to Abraham, there is a change of the promise for, the, for obedience to the fifth commandment. It's not that we will live long in the land the Lord is giving to us. Why? Because the land the Lord is giving to us, for Jesus' sake, is the cosmos, right? And that's, we're awaiting that in the age to come. Jesus has earned that inheritance for us by his obedience, not by our obedience, so anyone united to Jesus by faith cannot lose the, the, that promise of, of receiving the cosmos by their disobedience. But we can lose out on the promise that remains for those who obey the fifth commandment. Paul says we live under a promise. We live under, and, and this promise encourages us to obey the fifth commandment. And that promise is that it will go well with us and we will live long on the earth in this life. In this life. In other words, children, the Lord promises that our lives will, be, will not be as hard or as short as they, might have, as they might be if we disobeyed the fifth commandment. Are, are any of you here looking to shorten your life? Or, or to make your life harder than it might already be? Anybody? I don't see any hands here. Right? It's naturally, we want to make life better. We want to enjoy a long and a full life, right? Well, then we need to listen to the promise of Proverbs 13, 15, where Solomon says, Good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard hard. That's a promise. The way of transgressors is hard. Now friends, you, what promise do you want to live hanging over your head? Do you want the promise that it will go well with you and that you will live longer? Or the promise that you will live a hard and short life? Which one do you want? Now, we should qualify these promises because there's other things that Scripture uh, tells us, other truths and other portions of Scripture. So I would say, generally speaking, it is true that if you live under the authority of your father and your mother, if you live under the authority of other lawful authorities, that life will be better for you. Life will, in fact, be longer for you than it might otherwise have been, generally speaking. But yet there will be people who honor their father and mother, yet they live short lives and hard lives. That's true. 
this is a proverb, right? It, this promise. Ultimately, the Lord determines the length of our days, and He's sovereign over all that befalls us. So the way we should think about this, maybe even the way we should say it, is that in as far as it serves the glory of God and what He knows to be good for me, and as far as it serves those things, if I honor my father and mother, my life, it will go well with me. And I will live long on the earth, longer than I would have. Life will be easier than it otherwise could have been, right? And we, we can't deny either that it's generally true that, that those who rebel against father and mother, who rebel against authorities, that they will, live a, they will live harder lives. They will live shorter lives. That's generally true, but, you know, you can see wicked people who live easier lives and longer lives too. So don't misunderstand, don't... Don't overemphasize or underemphasize the promise here. Have you ever known, though, a, a child who got sick of being told what to do and decided to run away from home? I've known plenty of those. Did it go well for them? I was thinking about it. I, I couldn't think of a single example of someone I'd known that had they decided to, to leave home because they, they were sick of being told by their mother and father what to do. I couldn't think of a single example of someone I know that has done that where it went well for them. In fact, when I look into their lives, I see the wreckage and the pain of foolish choices. I see substance abuse and dysfunctional and broken relationships, serial divorce, sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, chronic unemployment, homelessness, broken down and sick bodies, and deep, deep regret. Not a few of us here have learned the wisdom of the fifth commandment the hard way. Now, don't raise your hand, but I'll, I'll, I'll raise my hand. I've learned the wisdom of the fifth commandment the hard way. I did that. And so I plead with you, young people, with a burden for that it would go well with you, that you don't take the hard way, that you learn instead the wisdom of the Apostle John that he imparts in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, where he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not heavy. You know what is a burden? Rebellion. Rebellion is a burden and a weight that drags souls down to hell. People are ruined by refusing to honor and to obey the authority of God and their biological mother and fathers and their spiritual mothers and fathers. But as we close, I want you, as important as the fifth commandment is, it is immeasurably important that you know that it's, it isn't your obedience to the fifth commandment, but Jesus' obedience to the fifth commandment upon which your salvation rests. Now, have you ever, ever wondered why the Bible tells us so little about the uh, early life of Jesus, the first 30 years of his life? There's so little information there, and we, we would love to have more. It's really only Luke's gospel that, that gives us any insight of what Jesus was up to when he was a child or a young man. Luke 2.40 tells us that he grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2.49 tells us that from a young age, he was about his heavenly father's business. And Luke 2.51, this is particularly interesting to me, uh, tells us that as he was raised in Nazareth by his parents, Joseph and Mary, he submitted to them. He lived in submission to Joseph and Mary. And I want you to think about that. The eternal Son of God, the sinless Son of God, submitted himself to honor and obey Joseph and Mary, who are two sinners like you and me. Why did he do that? Well, he did it because it's the will of God for children. To submit themselves to honor and obey parents, elders, governing authorities, all of whom are sinners. And so it is. There is nothing that Jesus calls you to do 
that He has not already done on your behalf in obedience to His heavenly Father. He came to do the will of His Father in heaven so that He could stand condemned in our place as our sinless substitute. And God, our Father, accepts His obedience, His perfect obedience, as if it were our obedience. So again, if you think about it, it is Jesus' perfect keeping of the fifth commandment that saves those who believe. Hallelujah. He accepted a short and brutal life to give us eternal life. He was cut off from the earth to give us the cosmos. And we would be like ignorant and foolish children not to trust Him for that reward and then follow Him for His promised blessing on our lives as we would give ourselves to honoring our mother and father. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the wisdom of your word and Lord, how it turns us, our thinking on our head and shows us that we have been fools and that there is the way of life, the way of blessing lies here in your holy word. And we ask, Lord, that all of us, all of us who are children, which is each one of us, and all who are um, chronologically young, that, they, that we would all gain wisdom from this portion of your word, that we would treasure the fifth commandment as a jewel in the crown of righteousness that Jesus will give to those when he returns. And may it be our heart's desire to honor and to render honor to whom honor is due and obedience to whom obedience is due. Father, shape us and work in us by your Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, and we're going to sing uh, Psalm 1, Psalm number 1, which uh, gives us instruction about um, how to have things go well for us and to live long on the earth. And um, so I thought we'd sing Psalm 1 together. We're going to sing Psalm 1b if you're using the hymnal. How bless the man. Amen. We're going to use the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 104. It's on page 891. 891, if you're using the hymnal, we're going to use this to confess our faith together as we come to the Lord's Supper. And this is, um, what did I say, 891? (laughs) 
if you look at it here in the hymnal, you can see the, the scripture proofs, which would be uh, useful uh, to maybe snap a photo of it. You can read those later and see how this uh, question and answer is a summary of what scripture teaches concerning uh, God's will for us. And so I ask you, uh, what is God's will for you in the fifth commandment? That I shall honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and mother and all those in authority over me. Submit myself with proper obedience to all their good teaching and discipline. And also that I be patient with their failings. For by their hand, God wills to rule us. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we all need the grace of God to be uh, what he's calling us to be, right? Amen? We need the grace of God, and, and uh, some, sometimes I think we would really like it if God just zapped us with grace. Sometimes I talk, this is like, you know, you know, it was just, that was the, the means, like, I need grace over here, and it just comes and he, like a, like one of those stun guns or something. And, um, but he doesn't do it that way, does he? He uses means. He uses conduits, right? He uses, um, if you do, kids, if you don't know what a conduit is, you know what a straw is? You use a straw? Like, a, a straw is a conduit. It's, it, it, it brings what you're really after through it and into your mouth, right? Well, God uses conduits. He uses means to give us what we need. And we might not like it, but parents are that in the life of their children. Parents and their instruction is a means of grace. God doesn't zap you with the grace you need. He gave you a mother and a father, and he said, listen to them. <laughs> Receive my grace. Receive my blessing. Right? So don't, don't wait for God to zap you with grace. Look to the means that he has appointed to show you grace, to impart grace to your life, and one of those uh, means of grace is here, the Lord's Supper, where uh, he is going not to zap you with grace, but he's going to have you ingest it, take it into your body. Well, the, the symbol of it, right? The symbol of it. it but this is a means of grace. It, it is, in other words, it is God speaking to you, telling you what he has done for you in order that you might be saved through his son, Jesus Christ, and to stir you up uh, to love and good works. And so as we come uh, to the Lord's Supper, um, if you want to think of it this way, here's his zap of grace for you. And may we enjoy and receive it from his hand for what it is. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would uh, give all of us who believe, all of us who have confessed Christ and and professed him in your church, and been baptized, and joined ourselves to your church, as, as we would come to receive uh, this food and drink from the hand of our Savior Jesus. May we uh, receive grace. May we have grace in us from you. Uh, may we marvel at your grace, and thank you uh, for your love. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we do use wine here. Uh,